but they are fired up in here. Hey, if you're watching this on video right now at the Littleton campus, can you make some noise? Littleton campus, let me hear you. Arvada campus, let me hear you, Arvada. You guys can help celebrate Arvada. Lakewood, where you at, Lakewood? And Park Meadows, let me hear you. Over there in your brand new fancy building. Brussels, Belgium, let me hear you. Austin, Texas, we love you. And at every single location, whether you're in a house, an office, a hike, a bike, a car, a building, wherever you're at, can you help me make some noise for the three best campuses we have? Our God Behind Bars men and women. We love you so much, God Behind Bars. We love you, your family. All right. You ready for church? Hey, if you're watching online, we love you so much. Thank you for joining us. If you're watching online and you're close to a building, can I encourage you to get to a building as soon as you can? Man, there's just something special that happens when we get together for worship, and I don't want you to miss it. If you're not close to a building, man, we love the technology that God has blessed us with, and we love that we get to do church together with you right where you're at. So we're in this series called, what's it called, Andrew? Yard Sale. You never know what you're going to find. That's the tagline. What that means for the, whoever's speaking is, you never know what you're going to preach about. That's what that means. <laughs> and so here's the whole Bible. Good luck. That's what that means. And, but I'm telling you guys, I've been praying. I've been praying for us as a church family. Um, I've been seeking counsel. I've been really digging in, and I feel like God's given me a good word for us today. You excited? Let's pray. God, I thank you that we get to do church together from literally thousands and thousands of locations around the world. I thank you that you're with us no matter where we're at. I thank you that you care about us, that you see us, that you know what we're dealing with, you know what we're going through, you know what our challenges are. And God, today I pray for a supernatural amount of peace and joy and confidence and strength and faith in Jesus' name. And everybody said... Amen. Five years ago, my youngest son was seven. Is that right, babe? Seven. Ashton's seven. And uh, it was this time of year, five years ago, and our whole little, little community was doing a yard sale. And um, the yard sale is now over. And um, in fact, in the middle of the yard sale, my son Ethan took my son Austin's scooter out of the garage and sold it in the yard sale. That's a whole different story. A lot of discipline, parenting issues going on there. Um, but the yard sale's over, and we're all wrapping up, and I see our seven-year-old son walking down the street holding like a six-foot-three cardboard cutout. And he just couldn't be happier. And I'm like, what are you doing? And he goes, Look what I found at the yard sale. They gave it to me. And it was his new friend, his new best friend. He named him Billy. Go ahead and put a picture up of Billy. That was Billy. Leave that picture up for just a sec. I want you to really take Billy in for a second. Ashton took Billy and turned him into the funnest party favor you've ever seen. What he would do is, is if you were coming to our house, he would put Billy right in front of the door, and he would unlock it, and he would stand back, and he'd go, come in, and people would go, ah, and Ashton would just go, <laughs> he would put Billy in closets. When Jill would go to the bathroom, he would put Billy right outside the bathroom door, and so Jill would come out of the bathroom, and ah, and then you'd just hear Ashton from another room going, hee, hee, hee. Jill had a women's small group one night at our house. He put Billy in the downstairs bathroom right next to the toilet, and Kristen Austin, our friend, walked in there, and you would have thought somebody died. She screamed so loud when she turned the lights on, and Billy was in the bathroom with her. And then from another room, you'd hear Ashton. <laughs> Ashton left that yard sale with more joy than he ever expected. And that is my prayer for every single one of you today, that you would leave 
today's message in this series card called Yard Sale with more joy and peace and strength and faith than you ever expected. I've been, a pray, I've been praying Ephesians 3.20. God, do more in our hearts and our minds today than we ever even thought possible. That's my prayer. And so I'm excited. We're going to talk about joy. I, I realize that I have been, I've been talking to a whole bunch of people, especially over the last year, year and a half where the prayer always goes something like this. At the end of our talk, I'll say, what can I pray for you about? And almost consistently I hear, this is what I'm going through, and I just need, man, if you could pray for strength and joy. I just feel like that's been it, strength and joy. And then, and then I can't tell you how many times my friends have asked me, what can I pray for you about? And I find myself saying those same two words, just strength and joy, right? Anybody in here been praying for or asking anyone else to pray for them for a little bit of joy? Yeah. Six of you clapped. That's fine. You're the only six I like. Hey, I bet they're going crazy at Arvada right now. They're go- now, forget you people, but they're going crazy at Arvada. You know, we're supposed to have joy as Christ followers. When we put our faith in Jesus, it says not only does he forgive us of our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness, but also his spirit begins to live inside of us, and his spirit begins to produce byproducts in our lives, and they're, they're called the fruits of the spirit, and listen to what they are, but the fruit of the spirit is love. Joy. Let's try that again. The fruit of the spirit, Littleton, let's go. I need you today, but the fruit of the spirit is love. Come on, baby. Joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. We're supposed to have joy. When we put our faith in Jesus and his spirit is living in us, a byproduct is we're supposed to have joy. And so I started asking myself this week, then why is it that so many of us, that would be our prayer request today? If I'm supposed to have this joy from the fruit of the Spirit, from God's Spirit living inside of me, then why so many times do I find myself in my own private quiet times praying for joy? Jesus said this about our joy. He said, I've told you this, and we're going to go back in a second and look at the this. I've told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. He said, I don't want you to have a little joy. I don't want you to have partial joy. I don't want you to have some joy. I want you to have complete. I want my joy to be in you and your joy to be complete. And here's what I've learned after studying this this week and spending a lot of time on this and getting all nerdy with the Greek and all this stuff. What complete joy is not is momentary little bouts of, I think I'm happy, I think I'm not. I think I'm giddy, I think I'm not. I think I'll laugh, I think I'll cry. Complete joy is not this momentary emotion that we feel that goes up on a good day and down on a bad day. And I got it when I get a raise and I lose it when I get fired. And I got it when the relationship's perfect and I don't got it when I'm lonely and things are a mess. That's not complete joy, right? There's a difference. That's this momentary up and down, little giddy emotions. That's not complete joy. Complete joy Here's what, here's what the Bible says about complete joy. The joy, this is complete joy. The joy of the Lord is our strength. Complete joy is not momentary emotions over circumstances. Complete joy says when I'm a part of your life, I provide you with a certain amount of strength that begins to supersede every situation you walk through. And you can go through good days, bad days, hell or high water. You can't take my joy. I might not be laughing today, but I have a strength and a peace and a confidence. I have a joy that has caused me to have some inner strength. And that doesn't, that doesn't leave me when, when situations change. That's what complete joy looks like. And that's what Jesus said we can have. So he said, we just read it in, in uh, was John 15. I told you this so that my joy will be in you and your joy will be complete. So what we need to do then is we need to look at the this, don't we? What's the this? What, what, what is that? What is, what's the hinge point there? Because I want that complete joy. So if you have a Bible, flip open to John chapter 15. We're going to start in verse 5. You have a, a Bible that puts in red the words of Jesus. This will be in red. This is Jesus talking. He says, I am the vine, you're the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, 
you'll bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Jesus said, I'm a vine, you're a branch. When you're connected to me, fruit happens. If you do not remain in me, you're like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you're not connected to the vine, you don't produce the fruit. What's the fruit? Love, joy, okay? So, what, so what's he saying here? When you're connected with me, your life produces fruit, which is joy, but disconnected from me, your life doesn't produce that fruit. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory. I want you to bear much joy. I want you to bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you'll remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. And here it is. I've told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. We could have started in verse one, and if we had, I'd be saying this, in 11 verses, he said the word remain 11 times. We just read seven. In seven verses, he said the word remain seven times. God, what should I be doing if I find myself needing joy? Remain, 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 remain. I don't understand. What should I be? Remain. What? I'm, I'm not hearing you. Remain. I feel like I don't hear from you today, God. Remain. What should we be doing if we want more joy in our life? Remain, right? Go ahead and put that graphic up if you would. Here's what Jesus is saying. I'm the branch. You're the vine. That bunch of grapes, there's the fruit. That's joy. Wouldn't it be crazy if we could see branches talking and we see a branch disconnected from the vine and the branch, we see the branch going, God, please give me more fruit. God, please give me more fruit. And then we see the branch going to some other branches. Hey, would you ask God to give me some more fruit? And would you ask God to give me some more fruit? And would you ask God to, wouldn't at some point we go, hey, you don't need to pray anymore for fruit. You just need to connect back to the vine. And I started thinking, how many times have I been, God, I need more joy. God, I need more joy. Hey, guys, will you pray for me that God would give me joy? I'm just really struggling with my joy. Like, like, like my prayer is going to magically produce something that God's already told me how I get it. I wonder if Jesus has ever looked back at me and said, son, I love you so much. Stop praying for joy and start connecting to me. You need to stop looking for joy. Start looking for Jesus. That's where the joy comes from. Why would a branch that's purposefully disconnected pray for fruit and actually expect to see it? Jesus said, that's what I'm trying to tell you guys. And I don't want you to have partial joy. I want you to have full joy. I want you to have complete joy. The kind of joy that wells up in a strength that allows you to go through anything. That's what I want. So there's three things I want to I want to ask you to think about today or points to the message or whatever you want to say. So if you're taking notes, the first thing I think we need to really start to focus on is Remain in him. Am I remaining in him? Because if I'm not, I'm not going to speak for Jesus, but I kind of feel like you could pray for joy till your head pops off and might not get it if you're disconnected from the vine, if I understand that last passage correctly, right? And I'm not preaching at you, church. I'm telling you, this whole message is for me today, and I'm just hoping you get something out of it. So that's where we're at. Remain in him. Would you put those four words up? My temptation every single week I preach is just to put these four words up and go, let's talk about these again. Because I feel like after you put your faith in Jesus, if you focus on these four words, you're going to experience life to the fullest in ways you just haven't before. Talking to God, doing life with people that push you closer to God, getting in his word and saying, God, you speak to me about my life, putting on some worship, using this spiritual weapon called worship and letting the words just speak faith and proclaim faith over your life. Like these four things have helped me so much when it comes to remaining in God. These aren't the only ways to remain in God. I just want to give you a good start in case you're realizing I want some joy. I think I'm missing that. I need to start remaining. Where do I begin? 
Go ahead and leave the words up for just a second. I started, I started looking at these. Well, first off, let me say this. We did a series at the beginning of 2020 before any of us knew what was about to happen, and we called it Take Home Faith. You want to talk about prophetic, right? I mean, it just was. And, 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 and so we, we, our whole premise was, what if we couldn't meet together in a church? What could we take home with us to remain in our creator? And we had no clue what was headed our way. But we went into great detail about these four words that you see at the bottom of the screen. So go back and listen to that series if you want to really dig in on some of that stuff. But here's what I realized. Here's what I had a moment a couple weeks ago with God as I was, I was talking to God about my joy. God, I don't know why I don't have joy because on paper, everything's so good. And I just feel like I'm struggling to have joy right now. And, and the truth is, I was doing a lot of praying, but it wasn't like a relationship type prayer. I, I was just asking for stuff as if he were my business partner and Santa. <laughs> bless the food, bless the kids, bless the trip, keep us safe, help me make the thing, help me do the deal, help me, help me, help me, help me. It's not much of a relationship, is it? And most of the help me's were like, help me do this at church, help me do this at church, help me do this at church. It was just like, it's like, we're, in a real, it's like we're co-workers. Or he was my boss, because when I get in the Word, see, here's what I was doing. I'm just going to be honest. is I'm, I'm in the Word all the time for my job. See, I have to get in the Word to do this. I don't have to get in the Word to do this and then also get in the Word for just myself. That's what I wasn't doing. I was getting in the Word for work. God, give me a sermon. God, give me something to say. God, give me wisdom, Right? Worship, worship when I come here. I make some pretty high-level decisions about a pretty amazing worship team that's getting notoriety around the world right now, but I haven't used it as like my own personal weapon for a while. And what I realized is me and God had kind of become business partners, and I'm in my car one day praying, and, and yet, have you ever been asking God for advice or for anything, and a thought drops in your mind, and you're like, I never would have thought of that. When that happens to me and it lines up with scripture, I just assume that's from God. And so I'm going, God, I just want joy. God, I just want joy. God, I just want joy. And I feel like I'm doing some of these things. And you know what he said to me? He said, he said this. He said, I didn't hire you. I adopted you. I didn't hire you when you gave your life to me. I adopted you. I don't want to work with you only. I want to be your father. I want to have a relationship. What if you just talked to me about life? And what if you just got in the word and let me talk back? And what if we actually just had something and you actually started remaining in me and I wasn't just part of your job? I wasn't just a spiritual responsibility. I wasn't just something that you checked off to feel better about yourself as a religious task. I didn't hire you. I adopted you. Let's have a relationship, son. Because when you're connected to me like that, the fruit is joy. Remain in him. Psalm 1611 says, you will fill me with joy in your presence. When I decide to remain in him, the Bible multiple times says joy is the byproduct. And let's reread Nehemiah 8.10. The joy of the Lord is your strength. So go ahead and put that graphic up if you would, please. I've, I've said it, but I just want everybody to see it. When I remain in him, when I spend time in his presence, the Bible promises me a byproduct of that is joy. And that is not giddy, emotional, momentary. It only works on good days and when situations are, are funny. It becomes the strength inside of me. It becomes the foundation for which I stand on. And now I have a strength inside of me because I was in his presence and I got his joy and that joy is my strength through the Lord. I can now walk through anything life throws at me and I've got a joy that supersedes any situation. That's what we're looking for. Am I remaining in him? And, and let me just throw out a last minute challenge is this. Please don't let this be a good intention. I can't tell you how many times 
I have been in church, and I think if we were all honest, a lot of us would say, yeah, me too, where I hear stuff like this, I get in the Word, I'm reminded of this, and I go, that's what I want, that's what I need, that's what I want my life to be about, and that's about as far as it goes. Guys, start calendaring this stuff. Start thinking about your day before you wake up. Start thinking about your week before it starts. Start putting some time on the calendar. And if, if, if this is all foreign to you, start slow, right? Maybe this week I'm gonna read a little bit each day or maybe this week I'm gonna pray a little bit each day. I'm telling you, if this is your church, you gotta get into a small group. That's the best way to foster relationships that are gonna push you towards the presence of God, which will get you the joy, which will give you the strength, which will let you walk through anything. So get on the app today. Don't wait any longer. Get on the website today. Get in a group. If you can't find one you like, hit that start a group button. We'll help you. But let's not make this stuff good intentions. Put it on the calendar. Let's start making remaining in him something that we actually do and allow his promise to play out in our life and begin to change things. That's what we want. Amen? Amen. Number two, if you're taking notes, be thankful. Oh, my gosh. We can change our emotions with this one phrase. Be thankful. If you have a Bible, flip over to Philippians 1. We're going to read a few places, I think three in Philippians 1 and then one in Philippians 4. Let me give you some quick context. Philippians is a very short four-chapter book of the Bible written by the Apostle Paul from a prison. He wants to, his dreams are, he feels his calling is, is to be traveling around, speaking about Jesus and starting churches. That's his dream. But he's arrested because some religious leaders didn't like the fact that he was talking about Jesus because the religious leaders were actually the guys who were part of the movement to crucify Jesus. And so if he really was God, then that makes them look a little shady. And we don't like that. So you got to shut down the Jesus talk. And he wouldn't shut down the Jesus talk. So they put him in prison. So you got a guy that's away from his family. Family stuff's a mess. Relation stuff's a mess. Career stuff's a mess. Finances are not there. Dreams are not there. That feeling of, I thought I'd be at a different place in my life at this age. I thought at this stage of my life, this is what it would look like, but it looks like this, and I can't believe it, and nothing's working out. Paul knows the feeling. Everything's falling apart. He's chained to a Roman guard 24 hours a day, and he knows I'm probably on my way to be executed for a crime that I didn't commit. Everything's falling apart, and he writes this four-book four-chapter book called Philippians to some friends of his at Philippi, a church that he was a part of starting. And theologians all over the world will agree the, the theme of Philippians is one word, joy. How does a guy chained to a guard in prison apart from everything he thought he wanted and needed in life write a book about joy? So I said, if I'm going to talk about joy, I better study Philippians. I'm going to see what's going on with this guy. How can he have this complete joy that isn't, it isn't at the mercy of his situation? So I just started reading it over and over and over. And one of the, one of the big things that just stood out to me is he just made a choice. I'm going to choose to be thankful to my God, no matter what I see, touch, hear, taste, smell in my life right now. I'm just going to choose to be thankful. Chapter one, verse three, I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy. I'm chained to a Roman guard. I can't even whisper prayers and have them be be private. I have to thank him if I want to be private. So I just gave up on that, and I just make homeboy listen to my prayers. Tough. You're chained to me. Go away if you don't like it. I'm going to pray. And when I pray, I just chose I'm going to stop complaining to God. I'm just going to start thanking God. And the byproduct in my life was joy. Verse 12, he says, hey, I want you to know, guys, you know what I've been through. You know what I'm going through. You know I'm probably going to be executed in here. You know what's, but get this, what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. I'm not even going to complain about it. I'm going to use where I'm at as a situation to just witness to somebody. I'm in a prison. I don't want to be in a prison, but they can't shut me up. I'm in a hospital. I don't want to be in a hospital, but they can't shut me up. I'm not married, and I wish I was. I'm married, and I wish I wasn't. We'll talk about that later. (laughs) Whatever's going on, I'm just going to be thankful to God for where he's got me, and thankful to God for what he's done for me, and thankful to God that Jesus died for me, and thankful to God that we're going to heaven, and I'm going to help somebody figure that out today. 
And as a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I'm in chains for Christ because they can't shut me up. And because of my chains, most of the brothers and sisters have become confident in the Lord and dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. I'm thankful that I'm chained up today because I'm building up somebody's faith because they're seeing my joy. They're seeing my witness didn't stop with the when the chains got clamped on, and now their faith's being built up. So I'll just praise God for that, and joy will be my byproduct. In verse 18... Verse 18, he says, I know, I know, everything sucks, and yeah, there's no people in my life right now. I can't hug my friends. I can't hug a family member. I can't chase down my dream. I can't do everything I thought I was going to, but you get, but guess what? That's not going to stop me. I'm just going to continue to rejoice. That's just what I do. That's just who I've chosen to be. I'm going to continue to rejoice. And then he sums it up in chapter four, summing it all up, friends. If you want joy that supersedes your situation like I have joy that supersedes my situation, I'd say you do best by filling your minds and meditating on things true, noble, reputable, authentic, compelling, gracious. Start thinking about every way that God has shown you grace. Start thinking about the best and not the worst. Make a different list. Stop focusing on all the things that suck and start focusing on all the things that God has done for you. Make a different list. Start focusing on the beautiful, not the ugly. Things to praise and not to curse. And then he says, you want what I have? You want that complete joy Jesus told us about? Put into practice what you learned from me. Red Rocks Church, if we want what he's got, let's put into practice what we're learning from him. Let's start making a different list. Here's what I want to challenge you to do this week. Go write down minimum 10 things that you're thankful for. You're like, I don't have anything to be thankful. Let me, help, let me help you get started. Thank you, Jesus, that you died on a cross for me. Thank you, God, that you love me just the way I am. Thank you that you value me even when I don't value myself. Thank you that you provided me for a way to go to heaven and be with you for all of eternity, and I've never earned it or deserve it. Thank you that I have some clean water to drink today. We got a whole lot of things to be thankful for that we forget. Make a list of what you have to be thankful for. You can make a list of all the things you're complaining about, but the truth is it's like a photographic memory. You probably won't even have to because you just got it. But if you want, write those things out. Write down everything that's wrong and then do what Paul says. I'm just not going to focus on the things to curse. I'm going to focus on the things to praise and put this list on top of that list and go, this is where I get to, I get to choose what I focus on today. I thank my God for this. I thank my God for this. I thank my God for this. What if you did that? Now, now let me just say this. I know that everybody that is listening or watching this right now is not a part of social media, but I know that the majority are. But here's what I also know. Even if you're not on social media, every single human being, because we're just broken in a broken world, we will all deal with the temptation to compare our lives to somebody else. Comparison is an absolute thief of our joy. And the reason I bring this up is because this, because Countless people in this church family, including myself, find ourselves doing this almost every day. And here's what you're doing the entire time. There's a battle going on in your soul every time you do this because we're seeing everybody's highlight reel, right? And so we go, oh my gosh, their family is so happy. You didn't see the fight they had right before they fake smiled for that picture, but they're not gonna post that, right? We know the truth. I wish I had a family like that. I wish I looked like that. I wish I drove that. I wish I lived there. I wish I had that. I wish I vacationed like that. I wish I got invited to that. I wish, I wish. And it's stealing joy. I'm not a get off social media. I, I'm on it, I'm off it. I try to gauge where my soul's at. But I would say this. If you're going to be on social media for 20 minutes today telling your soul that what you have is not enough, would you spend at least 20 minutes looking at the other list today and thanking God for the things that you have to be thankful for? And if you run out of things, then call somebody up and start telling them what's on your list and just start bragging to somebody else about what God's done because there, there's got to be a counterbalance because we got too many things in our lives trying to steal our joy and our contentment right now. So take that 20 minutes and at least counterbalance it. And you want to get crazy joy? 
What if for three days you didn't even look at social media and then spent 20 minutes thanking God? Oh my gosh, what would happen? Right? We got to look at a different list. And number three, live on mission. Man, there is something about living on mission when it comes to what God has commissioned every single one of us to do with our lives, with our time, with our talents, with our treasure. That brings joy that just seems to supersede situations, doesn't it? I talked to a girl who's been in GBB for many years, God behind bars, for those of you who are joining that don't know what that means. And she went to jail for many, many years and just got released. And I got the opportunity to talk with her recently. And she said, I found more freedom and more joy inside of that penitentiary than I've ever had my entire life because I gave my life to Jesus and I started sharing my faith and discipling other believers and raising up women of faith inside the Denver Women's Correctional Facility. And I've never had more joy and never felt more freedom, she told me that, than when I was in that prison living on mission. There's something about living on mission that brings joy into our life that supersedes the situation around us. I saw this in the very first verse of Philippians, the very first chapter, the very first verse. He hits the introduction. He says, Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus. And I went, that's it, isn't it? That's how you write a book on joy when your whole life is in the toilet as far as everybody else is concerned. Because no matter where they got me, no matter where I'm locked up at, no matter what, I'm, what I don't have, no matter what I wish I had, no matter how bad the dream is going, no matter how far off I was in estimating where I'd be at this point in life, you can't take away my faith. My life is about Jesus Christ. I'm a servant of Christ. I'm building his kingdom. You can't take my joy. That's a joy that supersedes situations. Jesus said, let me tell you the mission. The very last thing he ever said before he left this world, he said, let me make sure you know the mission. He said, Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. So I'm about to go be with my father until I return to take you to heaven forever. So here's what I want you to remember. Don't forget the mission. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Go help lost people find Jesus. Go make heaven more crowded. That's your mission on this planet. Take your time, take your talents, take your treasures, and get on mission. And when you're on mission, man, there's a crazy joy. Jesus tells a story about it to help us understand it in Luke 15. He says, suppose, the, the, he tells a story Two guys who understand shepherding and lost sheep, but he's talking about reaching lost people, and he's talking to a group of religious people, and he's talking about people who don't know him yet, who don't have faith in God yet, who aren't on their way to heaven yet. He says, suppose one of you has a 100 sheep and loses one. Well, doesn't he leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost one till he finds it? Doesn't he take all his time, talents, and resources and go try to find somebody who's lost? And when he finds it, what happens? He joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Look, he's tired. He's been on the run. He's been on the go. Something's wrong. Something went wrong. Something's missing. But all of a sudden, I went after a lost person. I'm filled with joy. He calls his friends and neighbors said, together and says, hey, Come rejoice with me. I found my lost sheep. Jesus is telling us that's what happens with us. Your life can be falling apart in so many areas. But when you remember my time, my talents, and my treasures, no matter what my situation are, they are going to be used to build God's kingdom. There's a joy that comes with that that can't be superseded. Is your life on mission? A lot of really successful rich people commit suicide every year. Well, why? They have all the stuff that most of us think would make us joyful because they get a whole bunch of time and a whole bunch of talents and a whole bunch of treasures and it's off mission and it ends up meaningless. Listen, you can have all the time in the world. You could be a self-made billionaire and retire at 20 and have more free time than you know what to do with. And apart from being on a mission given to you by your creator, it can bring spurts of fun and spurts of giddiness and even some laughter, but not a lasting joy. It won't stick with you on a bad day. It just won't. You can be the most talented person and the most smartest person, the most gifted person on the world. And if all you do is build your kingdom with it, it won't bring you a lasting joy that supersedes situations on the bad days. 
just won't. You can have all the money in the world, but if all it does is build your kingdom, I'm telling you, there's, there's something that you were, you were hardwired to crave to be on mission by your creator, and when we're off that, that joy is just missing. It just is, and we see it with Paul. He says, I'm just focused on building God's kingdom, so it doesn't matter what's happening around me. There's a joy that rises up in me. This is why, and I think this is gonna click for you, this is why I have said things like, on paper, my life looks so great. Why don't I have joy? Because I got the wrong things on paper. I got the wrong things on paper. Because on paper, I got a good family and a good job and I live in a good country and I'm safe, and I got food, and I got plenty. I've got extra. I've got a closet that has multiple clothes in it. I have multiple bathrooms. We have multiple cars in our family. On paper, I ought to have joy. No, 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 I got the wrong things on paper. Because what brings me joy is, am I actually remaining in my creator? He didn't hire me, he adopted me, and am I acting like that? Am I choosing to be thankful on a daily basis, no matter what my situation looks like? Is my life on mission? See, when these things are on paper, then on paper, I'm probably gonna have some joy. Sometimes when we go, I don't know, on paper, everything's working out. We got the wrong things on paper, don't we? I learned this. Just, I had a beautiful reminder. Banyan come up. I had a beautiful reminder of this. Oh, gosh, I don't even remember. Maybe four or five years ago. I, um, I hadn't, you know, really kind of hit the wall with my anxiety as I did two years ago, but I was definitely struggling with anxiety four or five years ago. And um, I had a shoulder surgery. And they put me on Vicodin when I got home from the, from the surgery. So I was taking Vicodin. Well, what I didn't realize is Vicodin was like, just my system would not work with Vicodin, and I started having real crazy, like claustrophobic feeling panic attacks that I could not get under control. I'm walking around the house, I'm sometimes in tears, sometimes I'm walking outside, like I was a mess. And then Sunday morning rolls around and my wife's like, let's go to church. I'm like, I can't. Like I, could, I can't function, I can't talk to anybody, I'm a disaster. And she's like, you don't have to go out in the, in the, in the sanctuary, just stay, just stay in the back. And so, she drove me to church, and like twice I wanted her to stop and pull over the car just so I could get out and breathe. Like I was a mess. And we got to the Lakewood campus, and I couldn't go out and talk to anybody, and I did, couldn't even see the staff, so I just stayed back in this little office where there was a TV, and I was just like still crying and like, God help me, God help me, God help me. And then I'm watching the service, and it happened to be a baptism Sunday, and I'm watching the, the amazing campus pastor, Josh Kingry, baptize people and I just something happened in my soul something changed and it's, all of a sudden I had this thought I get to be a part of that because several years before that we did our very first ever big end of year kind of giving series and we were gonna raise money to try to buy some church buildings because we were leasing all of our spaces and we were about to get kicked out of all of them. And I told God I wanted to be generous and he asked me to sell a Harley. And I was like, mm-mm, you've gone too far. <laughs> and after much arguing with God, I did. And it was part of me and my wife's offering for that. And I got to, I was in the middle of panic attacks, like couldn't hardly control my emotions. I was miserable, I was crying, I was a wreck, couldn't talk to anybody. And all of a sudden I'm watching a TV screen and I'm realizing I got to sacrifice something that was very treasure, it was my treasure, I loved that thing. I got to sacrifice part of what God had given me to be on mission and to build his kingdom. And look right there, that person right there gave their life to God at the Lakewood campus. They're going public today at the Lakewood campus with their faith. I got to be a part of that. And a joy started to come over my, my emotions, and I wasn't laughing. But it was a strength, because the joy of the Lord turned into my strength. And I got through a really tough situation. When our life is on mission, it changes things, church. Would you put up that recap? Here's what we want to do. 
I want to remain in him. I'm going to stay thankful and I'm going to live on mission. Now listen, go back and study John chapter 15. There are so many other lessons on joy in that chapter. These are just three of them. It talks about obedience. It talks about getting in the word. It talks about remembering how loved you are. It's got so much for you. Just go over it this week over and over and over and then hit Philippians one through four over and over and say, God, speak to me about the joy or lack thereof in my life today because he doesn't want you living joyless. He wants you to not just have joy, but be complete in his joy. Amen. All right, and here's where it all started. One last verse, and I'm going to pray. Psalm 51, 12. Remember the title of the message? Did I ever tell you the title? I didn't tell you the title, did I? Well, that didn't work very well. (laughs) The title of the message is Restore My Joy. Because here's where it all starts. Restore to me the joy of salvation make me willing to obey. All the things we talked about today happen after salvation. I learned this when I was 24 years old, as I was walking out to the car after leaving a church service and giving my life to God and realizing I've never experienced a freedom like this in my life. I've never felt joy like this in my life. It starts at salvation. And so if you're watching this or listening to this and you know, like, I've never put my faith in Jesus. I need to ask him to forgive me of my sins and be the Lord of my life. So when he died on the cross, that actually applies to me. I want my sins forgiven. I want his spirit to live inside of me today. And I want to go to heaven forever. And and sure as shooting, I want the joy that you're talking about today. It starts at the point of salvation. Who says sure as shooting? I don't know. Let's pray. God, thank you so much that you're with us that you love us, that your son died for us, that when we choose to connect our lives to him, the byproduct is a joy that we crave with every ounce of our being, a joy that takes us past situations, a joy that turns into strength and begins to supersede situations. I wanna ask two questions with everyone's heads down and eyes closed. First is this, you are already a Christ follower. Maybe you have been for years. The truth is today you go, man, I I need joy. God's speaking to me today. There's there's some things I wanna do, but I wanna just start with saying, God, help me to learn the rhythms of how to live connected with you so that I can experience your joy. If that's you, raise your hand. I need some joy right now. We're just gonna pray together, amen. Whole bunch of us, amen. The second question is this. You don't have a relationship with Jesus yet, but you can just tell this is my moment. I can feel it in my heart. God is tapping on my shoulder right now. I want to make him the Lord of my life. I'm not going to be perfect, but I want to put my faith in him. I want his spirit in me and heaven forever. If that's you, raise your hand right now and I'm going to pray for you. Go ahead, put them up at all locations. Keep them up. Praise God. Put them up, Brussels. Let's go. Come on, God behind bars. Austin, Texas, all the Denver campuses. Let's respond to what God's doing. Amen. God, I thank you that you're with us right now. I pray for everyone who raised their hand seeking joy today. God, I pray that you would remind them that you've already made a way for them to experience some amazing joy. I pray that you would remind them that they have so much to be thankful for. I pray that you would remind them that you've given them a life-changing mission to be a part of. And God, I pray that you help them begin to take some steps of faith towards you, begin connecting back to you, remaining in you, and experiencing that joy that turns into strength that supersedes our situations. And God, I thank you for the eternal lives that are being changed right now, literally around the world, as people for the first time are saying, I need Jesus, I choose Jesus, I want you, God. I thank you, God, I pray they would experience your presence in a real and authentic way. And everybody at every location said, amen, let's stand up, let's worship.